Hey, how are you guys? Hi. Welcome. Yeah. Oh, it's good to see everyone, and we're really excited to give the second presentation for the Glacier Lake Ecology BioBlitz. I'm Melissa Slotic, and you might remember me from the first uh, training session that we did a little while ago. And I'm here today just to introduce our uh, citizen science coordinator and our loon intern who are working with uh, all of the citizen scientists this summer and with you folks when you come in the spring. So uh, welcome to Terry Peterson and Laura Luther. And they're going to talk to you about loon ecology and uh, loon behavior and get you all dialed in on what you'll be doing uh, at the end of the program for the day when you come on May 25th or May 26th. So welcome, ladies, and I'll let you take away. Okay, I'm going to do the first part. Laura's going to do the middle, and then I'll end up for you. So. The first thing I want to do is I want to welcome you because I'm so excited that you are coming to Glacier National Park. And you will really be the first people ever to do this Lake Ecology Bio Blitz. So this is pretty significant. This will be the second part of the two-part training. The first part you went through with Jamie and Melissa was focusing on what you'll be doing with iNaturalist and looking at aquatic insects. This part is going to be about loons. And this is part, you will become part of a cadre of citizen scientists. By the time this half hour is over, you'll be ready to roll with me. So, this is going to be you. You're going to be looking at these lakes in Glacier Park. Citizen science here started in 2005 with just a small six week, let's try it on program. By 2006, we started training volunteers, and every year, every year since then, our program's grown. So your role as citizen scientists, you're going to be able, at the end of today, when you come, you'll observe loons at a science lake. And actually, this lake in the lower right will be going there. You'll become educated about loons, their management, some other species, loon habitat, and a little bit of scientific information. Now, we are not going to go over boring stuff like the data sheet today. We're going to wait, and I'll do that in person with you at the site. So welcome to Glacier Park. And I hope you're going to enjoy your time with us as a citizen scientist. Now, loons are known as a symbol of really remote wilderness. So I want you to close your eyes. I can't see you, but those eyes better be shut. And imagine you're in a wilderness and you're hearing this. Or this sound, which is more characteristic from Hollywood. We're going to talk about this loon speak later, but that does remind me of wilderness. Okay, this presentation, so you know what we're going to go over, it's going to be about common loons. You're going to learn some general facts, some threats, some management, the status and the research we're doing here at Glacier Park, as well as you will know how to identify loons, their important behaviors for your data collection. We'll define the loon speak for you, and you'll learn a little bit about their life cycle. Now, loons are very they have very specific adaptation. They are not ducks. They aren't part of the duck family. They're part of the albatross or the penguin family, which I find remarkable. Their striking coloration, do you see this black and white checker on the back? That makes when the water's riffling or it's just a little ripply, it makes loons totally become invisible in the ripples, the choppy water. Now notice how their chest is white and the underbelly is white. And that means that from underneath, the fish can't even see them. So it gives this predator of fish on top of the food chain uh, unequivocally good chance at getting something tasty to eat. The red eyes, that allows loons to see really well in deep, dark waters. Um, now the little stripy part on the neck is called their necklace. Um, every loon has a definitive necklace like a fingerprint. 
but us being humans, I can't tell one loon from another. And both the males and females are about the same size. This is a picture of a loon other than when it has its breeding plumage. They're kind of brownish gray guys. This is from the coast off Washington. They spend their um, seasons when they aren't here breeding, which is about April through September or October. They spend it on the ocean. And it's really remarkable. They can go from ocean to freshwater and back again. They have special glands in their body, and they excrete the salt through the nostrils on their nose. And when they're out in the ocean, they live on fish, crustaceans, insects, kind of like here. Now, this photo is a loon, and we call it submarining. So you only see mostly the head, hardly any of the neck. The reason they can submarine, ducks could not do this, is loons can compress the air out of their feathers, and they can even reduce the air by expelling it out of their lungs. They're quite a heavy animal, as well as, amazingly, when um, most birds have hollow bones, loons have bones that are very dense. All this is adaptations for diving and getting fish. We'll talk about the behavior of this loon in the lower right. But I wanted you to see these are really short wings on this very heavy body. It means that for a loon to take off, he has to run on the water with big web feet. It takes a huge distance for him to take off. And all of this is an adaptation for diving deep and hunting. In England, they're called the Great Northern Diver. Um, and this is the way they get their primary prey. Now, you can see this loon is going after that fish. Actually, it's not poking the fish with its bill, um, but it will open its bill and grab the fish. Fish are pretty slick. So in order to hold on to that fish, uh, loons have an adaptation in their mouth where the top, the roof of the mouth, and the top of the tongue have really rough ridges on them. Also, look at those feet in the back. They are huge and webbed for not only paddling through the water, but they can steer very well through the water. Now, loons can typically dive, especially around here, 30 feet deep or so, and they'll stay under for 30 to 45 seconds. But they can go 200 feet deep and stay underwater for about 15 minutes. So I assure you, when you're watching loons week after next with me, and you lose that loon, no, it hasn't gone forever, but you better be scanning the whole lake because it will pop up at the other end and just shock you. There are lots of threats, with, um, especially from this human population, to loon. Human disturbance is, um, and human development is one of the largest threats. And what I mean by development is a dock out into a lake, a house, it reduces the um, number of nesting sites or potential nesting sites that loons can have. Now, when I talk about water level fluctuation here, I mean that when a boat goes by with a motor, the wake can actually flood the nest, and it can float the eggs out of the nest and destroy that one lane of eggs. Um, not only do we have boats that have motors, but also people go very close now in canoes and kayaks because they don't know any better. And the huge amount of disturbance can cause the pair to abandon the nest that they have been on for years and years. Um, you'll see this red circle around a little piece of fishing line with a lure on it is hanging off the loon. Loons, when we lose fishing equipment or a fish takes off and breaks the line and has a hook, the loon will um, swallow that hook and it'll land in its throat or stomach. This could have been on there quite a while. And this can lead to a sore spot infection. It's hard for the loon to deal with. Not only you can imagine it, it's painful. Now, lots of toxins affect loons. Lead affects almost all birds. And historically, we've used um, lead sinkers or weights on um, fishing lines. They're outlawed since 2004 in Glacier. But if a bird gets a piece of lead smaller than the end of a racer on a pencil, it will die from lead poisoning. 
Um, and this still happens because birds, not only loons, all kinds of birds pick up gravel from the bottom of a lake or a shore or a road, and that aids them in food digestion. So, of course, we do have loons die from lead poisoning still. Mercury exposure can cause reproductive failure, and it really affects chicks, their development, as well as their behavior. Um, the mercury enters the atmosphere, and it's a byproduct of fossil fuel. And it causes a, a neurotoxin to both the adults and the juveniles. Juveniles will preen and preen and preen or clean themselves and not have any other behavior, and eventually they will just die. Um, acid rain poses a huge risk to loons all over the United States. It kills um, the phytoplankton, the small, small um, microscopic animals, which actually cause reduction of fish. Wait one second, just a minute. I'm troubleshooting for a minute. We've no, gotten a message. Okay. Okay, let me go here again. Okay. You start no okay, can you see us? Can you see yes. Brett? Okay. Okay, are you hearing us okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. good. I wanted to make sure. Okay. okay. So, um, I was talking about acid rain. Um, so, anyway, it causes further release of mercury as well. Now, loons, we don't worry about oil spills so much here, but out on the coast where they're wintering, there can be oil spills. With climate change, we're having more erratic um, weather events. So we're having a lot more rise and fall of water. So a, a loon can't get to a nest if the water's too low. They cannot walk on lawn, um, on ground. They mostly just check themselves. Maybe we'll see it onto the nest. Now, loon eggs and chicks are really vulnerable to predation. Eggs are eaten by every animal you can imagine, ravens, raccoons, um, even otters. So if an adult loon abandons its nest for 15 to 20 minutes, uh, predation spikes. Also, West Nile virus, West Nile virus that we get here, actually loons get as well, and they die from the same disease. With climate change and water temperatures going up, uh, botulism can cause anaerobic bacteria, and then the loons can get botulism and die. Okay, management concerns not only here, but all over the western United States. Loons um, had a huge range, and now it's much restricted. We only have loons in four states in the west. Washington, Montana leading with population, Probably no loons in Idaho, uh, although we hope. We had one pair a few years ago, and a very few loons in Wyoming. Now, Glacier is very significant. We have only about 2.9% of the habitat. We have 20% of the reproducing loons. Last year, we had 54 loons here that we counted as citizen scientists in 14 pairs and 26 singles, they only made six chicks. Six chicks are not are almost not enough for a population to be stable. So loons are considered by the state of Montana, the legal term is a species of special concern. Now their habitat preferences are very narrow. They are the top of the food chain. They want lakes with calm, clear water, low disturbance, and a really good supply of fish. A family of loons, which is most are four, will eat a ton of fish over the summer. And I do mean a ton, for real. Now, they have a low recruitment rate, and this is a wildlife term. Recruitment means the rate at which the young are added to the population. I told you we only had six last year, barely enough to keep the population um, you know, uh, sustaining. Loons are very slow to mature. The adults will leave this fall and go to the coast, then the juveniles will, and they'll hang out in little bays on the coast. They will be that brownish bird. They will live there three years till they get um, adult breeding population. They will come back. They would like to go to the lake they were born on. If not, they need to find a lake within 10 miles. 
And my opinion is that in Glacier, we've got almost all the sites taken by nesting loons. When they come back, they don't breed at four. They usually don't breed it until seven. So in the bigger picture of the wildlife world, animals that get old and don't pr produce many babies are always very vulnerable. Okay, how do we determine the population health in Glacier? It's by all of you becoming citizen scientists and helping us do this. In the past, we only counted loons once a year, one day in the summer. And look at that red line. There's big bumps and big troughs. But then look at the bottom line. The um, green line and actually the blue line. These are pretty close together. The reason is, and look at that 2005 on, the more times you gather data, so we're at every lake in the park counting loons at least three times, some lakes ten times over the season, the line flattens out. There aren't as big a peaks or as low a trough. The more data you collect, it always makes the line more smooth and you have more accuracy. So now I feel like we have a handle on how many loons we really have in Glacier. Now I'm going to give the program over to Laura and she's going to talk a little bit about loon biology. Hi, I'm Laura, the Loon Citizen Science Coordinator, and, and I will be going over common loon ecology and behavior, as Terry said. And the common loon's summer habitat consists of inland wooded freshwater lakes. Lakes must be large enough for takeoff and landing and provide a high population of fish. Clear water is necessary for loons to see fish to prey on. As protection from predators, loons favor lakes with islands and coves. And that's what makes Glacier National Park ideal habitat because of our large inland glacial lakes. Common loon life cycle. Common loons mate monogamously and annually. Following ice off in spring, loons return to their breeding area to begin establishing a nest or pioneering a new territory. Arrival in Montana typically begins in the end of March. Loons will often utilize the same nest year after year if no significant habitat changes occur. Loons are territorial birds, and a mated pair of loons will defend an area of water from others. This photo shows a territorial pair of common loons circling at the nest site prior to laying eggs. And you might see in the picture colored bands on the loon's legs. And colored bands are used by scientists to assist in identifying common, um, to identify individual loons. Nest site selection, building, and initiation usually takes place between late April and early May. Both males and females will build the nest and incubate two eggs in just under a month. Eggs are incubated using the feet and are turned each time an adult returns to the nest. This is the most critical time for re reproductive success because the eggs are susceptible to a whole host of predators such as ravens, skunk, fox, and raccoons. And if a pair of loons lose their first set of eggs, they may re-nest a second time if it, is, if it is early enough in the summer season to do so. And nest disturbance is a primary concern. If the loons are disturbed, they will leave the nest and may not return for over an hour, which will leave the eggs chilled and vulnerable to predation. So when we are surveying and looking for loon nests, it is important to keep a distance. Nest characteristics. Nests are found adjacent to the water and no more than three feet from shore. And they are very close to water because loons are ungainly on land because their legs are positioned farther back on their body, which makes them ideal for diving, but not well suited for walking and it'll assist in escaping from predators if they are close to water. And loons prefer area, areas of tall reeds and cattails or small islands and usually build a nest using nearby vegetation, grasses, moss, and twigs. But the nest can also be built on bare dirt with no vegetation. Um, the top left picture is was used um, an observer used a spotting scope to locate this nest of a loon on a hummock nest. And the top right shows common loon eggs, which 
They vary in color and speckled pigmentation, and they're about three to four inches in diameter. And then the nest on the lower left is another example of a hummock nest. And then small islands are strongly preferred by loons because they offer quick, easy escape routes and protection from terrestrial predators. But as you can see on the bottom right, loons will often deposit their eggs on bare ground with little or no vegetation. So loon nests can be highly variable. Newly hatched chicks are covered with black downy feathers. Chicks leave the nest and begin swimming with the adults within 24 hours of hatching. Loon chicks typically hatch in Montana between late May and late June. And so you guys will be arriving at an ideal time to observe these young chicks. The parents often move the chicks to a nursery area characterized by shallow, marshy backwater with abundant insect and small fish populations. They prefer a site that is protected from wind and waves. And the time spent in the nursery area is critical as most chicks that are lost die within the first four weeks. Adults carry the chicks on their backs 65% of the time for the first few weeks after hatching. This is a really fun observation to be able to witness the small loon chicks swimming around and then also riding on the parents' backs. But when they are doing so, it um, protects the chicks from aquatic predators and keeps them warm and dry after being exposed to the cold water. Both parents catch fish and feed the chicks for the first couple of weeks. The chicks use a begging call to indicate hunger. One second. So that call was a chick begging its parent, parent for food. And as you can see in the photo, the black downy feathers of the newly hatched chick are replaced by brownish gray down feathers when the chicks are between 10 to 14 days old. By the time the young are 10 to 11 weeks old, flight feathers have erupted enough to allow flight practice. And at this time, chicks begin to defend, to fend for themselves, and are almost as large as their parents, but they lack the colorful plumage of the adult. The loon chicks in Montana typically leave their natal lake at about 10 to 12 weeks of age, so in mid to late September. And then the loon chick will travel to the coast and can remain there from at least two to three years of age until they reach breeding age. Once a common loon reaches breeding age, it will look like the beautiful black and white speckled bird with which we are more familiar. Loons produce a variety of vocalizations, the most common of which are categorized into four main types, the tremolo, yodel, wail, and hoot. First play the wail. is often compared to a wolf pal. The whale is an interaction call used to maintain contact and to communicate with other loons, such as its chick or mate. The tremolo call, sometimes called the laughing call. Loons often use this call to signal distress or alarm caused. It means the bird is frightened. And it is also the only vocalization used in flight and does not necessarily indicate distress when made during flight. The yodel is a long and complex call made only by male loons. It is used in the establishment of territorial boundaries and in territorial confrontation. In this photo, an adult male loon is yodeling at a perceived threat near its chick. 
A threat could be anything, such as another loon that entered its territory, or a boat or person. And now I will transition back into Terry Peterson. Now that you've learned how to tell some loons speak, we're going to look at some body language by loons and figure out what it means. You need to all be watching for subtle changes of loon behavior that might indicate disturbance. Here is this upright wing flap, and this is the above left um, picture. This is often done towards the thing the loon is aggressive towards. So it could be ducks, it could be another loon, it also could be a boat. And they can get so upset they'll stomp their feet, they'll be making vocalizations and come towards what they're aggressive at. Many, many people say, oh look, the loon likes me, it's coming to us. That's not true. If you see this, you need to turn around, pick up your stuff, and take off. The other posture we've seen before is a submarine, where just the head is above. This could tell you a good story. This bird could have just gotten slid off the nest and be stealth to swim away. So if you see this posture, look all around, see if you see another loon on a nest. Just be looking, because this could mean that you are very close to that loon's territorial nest. The bottom picture is a raised neck, circling bill, dipping, and diving. That means the loons are very angry, showing aggression. And this loon is showing aggression against two others that have entered its territory. So I want you to be sure to read the subtle messages these animals will send. Here is a picture of that. Um, loon dance, that severe disturbance. If you see this directed towards you, as I said, turn around and walk off. Now, I've shown you loons up close and really beautiful. You'd be really fortunate to see that, and if so, you would be much too close and it would be disturbance. So these pictures were all taken by citizen scientists and they were taken to verify that these are loons. These three pictures do show loons. So we're going to teach you how to use your camera or your smartphone and take a picture through the lens of the spotting scope for verification. Now, this is the last picture I'll show you for identification of just a loon. Um, when you see loons in the air, you'll have little chance to recognize them. But you'll see this long head with this long beak. And look at those feet and legs out back. They're not in front tucked up. It's not like a duck. But when you see the loon go by, he's going to be flying at 75 to 100 miles an hour. What may give you the clue is not the visual, but the sound you hear. They'll circle the lake and take off. Now let's look at common loons and some similar species you may see. Let's first look at the loon. Both sexes look alike. I can't tell males from females. Look at it. It's an all-black head with a black bill. They have a white chest and belly, which doesn't show at all in this picture. You see the checkering on the back and the feet, which we can't see through this picture, but when you look down on the water many times, you can see they're trailing behind. The picture in the upper right is of a common merganser pair, and this is really common to see in the park. The brown bird is the female and the black bird is the male. Notice how much white it has on it. Yes, it does have a black head, but look at that hot pink beak. So you'd know that bird for sure. Now down in the lower right is a barrel's golden eye. Notice how there's a whole bunch of them together. You'd never see that with loons. You might see two chicks and two adults, but that's it. The brown ones are the females. See the one right in the front? That's a male golden eye, and he does have a black head and a black bill, but look at that big white patch on the head. You would know that wasn't your loon. Now, just reminders to you as observers. Please, oh please, approach each lake cautiously. Stay as quiet as possible, no matter how many of you there are. Watch for changes in the loon behavior that may indicate that they're aware of you being there. Be certain of your observations. This lower left-hand picture is through a spotting scope. We can blow it up and check. Are those chicks in front? Report all zeros. Zeros are every bit as important as numbers for loons. 
that may say to me, maybe there were loons there last year and there aren't now, or maybe that lake doesn't have enough fish. I don't know, but if there aren't loons there, zeros are every bit as important. And if you find a nest like this one where the egg is here in the lower right, please do not tell everyone where that nest is. Um, leave the area as fast as possible and keep all information that you get while being a citizen scientist to yourself. Uh, we don't want these animals disturbed by people who absolutely have not been able to be trained as citizen scientists. So, any questions? Now, I, I want to tell you a little bit, yes, I want to answer that question, how your day will go. You'll meet us here at 8.30 at the Research Learning Center office, and we will go over that data sheet front and back, and then we will all take off with our equipment, all of our gear, and our packed lunch, and we will take the bus, the vans, and we will go to the lake. It will be a short hike in. When we get there, we'll be very quiet. We'll set up all our viewing equipment, and we will make a citizen science loon observation for an hour. And I'll just give you a hint that last year on the 25th, I saw one of those little black chicks on a parent's back. So let's hope we get to see that. And we'll spend the morning watching the loon and getting there. We'll have lunch, and probably in the afternoon, we'll be able to don our waders, go down to the lake and look at insects, and awesomely, we have a university professor that's an entomologist or a bug person coming with us. I can't wait to learn about insects. So I'll see you the morning of the 25th at 8.30 here. Welcome, everyone.